Uh, our next speaker is Dr. Uh, our last import is Dr. Uh, Rolly Tangente. Uh, he will be presenting a case on the conservative treatment of post-operative cerebrospinal fluid leakage in cervical spondylotic myelopathy at the Davao Doctors Hospital. Dr. Tangente. So, uh, good morning, good afternoon, everyone. So, I just would like to share our experience uh, with regards to this particular case. And I hope we, we learn a lot from, from this. Uh, and then later on, pag may mga questions, ipapasa ko kay Mike Jimenez. Well, anyway, this is a 40 year old male who came in because of lower extremity weakness, and the patient was uh, having difficulty walking. So the symptoms started two years ago and then progressed later on and then went into our institution. So what was significant here is that uh, he actually presented with uh, uh, long track signs and the uh, MJOA score was around 13. So we, ha we had this uh, MRI taken and so this is a, a very long OPLL and then starting from C3, C4, C4, C5. C5, C6, and down at C6 to C7. So the thing here is that we can opt to do an anterior procedure, but uh, it's easier to do it posteriorly, so we decided to do it posteriorly. So what I usually do when I do my decompression is I do a bicortical cut in both sides of the lamina and do an end block uh, 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 removal of the whole uh, posterior element. And then uh, we ended up doing uh, lateral muscle fixation at three to six, and then did a uh, C7 pedicle screw fixation. So it was a relatively uneventful surgery. So the thing was, uh, we saw the patient for our post-op, and about a day post-op, uh, we noted in the, in the JP drain that the fluid was uh, seemingly colorless, clear, uh, blood tinge, and uh, it, it came out with, with 300 cc of uh, drain uh, in 24 hours. So with that in mind, uh, you, you always consider uh, CSF leak already. And the other thing that we, we re should remember is that, uh, Mike, if, correct me if, I, if I'm wrong with this, uh, the total volume of your CSF from the ventricular system down to the, the cord level is around 200 cc. So therefore, if you have more than 150 or 200 cc, so it's, an, it's a high output uh, CSF leak. So those are the things that you need to remember. And we just thought of conservative management. So we had a drain in. Uh, the thing was we had to take it out upon, uh, upon considering uh, a CSF leak. The thing is that, remember, you end up with some hematoma formation in the epidural space. So once you take out the drain, that epidural space will increase the epidural pressure, which will counter the pressure from coming from the uh, subarachnoid space. So remember, the leak usually comes out one way. So it's from subarachnoid space going out to the epidural space. So there are two pressure gradient differences, and those are the things that we need to understand with regards to trying to look into the management of CSF leak. So once we took out the drain, the epidural pressure actually increases. The advantage of the epidural uh, hematoma is that it actually creates some sort of an inflammatory reaction, which usually ends up with, with a spontaneous cessation of the, the leak. So that is actually good for us. And the other thing is we tried to limit the fluid intake. And then we thought of starting the patient with acetazolamide. The thing with acetazolamide is that it is a car carbonic anhydrase inhibitor. It is a diuretic, and it actually ends up with excretion of your sodium, bicarbonates, even potassium. So those are the things that we need to rem remember when we consider acetazolamide. And acetazolamide actually also leads to a significant decrease in the production of your CSF in the core in plexus. And the other thing that we did was we elevated the head part of the bed. As you elevate the head part of the bed to somewhere around 
uh, 10 to 15 degrees, basically you're talking about the cervical spine, you actually decrease the pressure in that area, in basically uh, decreasing the subarachnoid pressure, thereby hopefully trying to decrease the leakage out from the subarachnoid area going out to the epidural space. But it is actually controversial. Some surgeons would actually try to just put them on flat, right? So basically, the second day post-op down to fourth day, uh, it was uneventful. Uh, on the sixth day post-op, uh, we noted some moist dressing. So obviously, it's already a leak. So therefore, we, this is an unrecognized durotomy. So when you think about unrecognized durotomy, you remember, you have a dura matter, right? And your arachnoid matter. For some reason, if you, 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 you have a dural tear, most likely if you don't tear the, the arachnoid matter, you don't end up with a leak. The problem is during extubation and some strenuous activity of, of, of the patient, even during the extubation part, it increases the subarachnoid pressure. And so therefore, it actually leads to some sort of a leak. And most likely, that happened in this particular case. And because of a CSF leak, think about, think about meningitis. So we thought of starting the patient with meropenem. So we, we got uh, an MRI of the cervical spine. And obviously, we have a leak at C3, C4, C4, C5. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. C6, C7. So the, the thing was, the fluid in the epidural space was around 19 cc. And in the paraspinal muscles, it was actually around 69 cc. So it's, there is a CSF pool in the epidural space, likewise in the paraspinal muscle. In the, on the ninth day post-op, the patient uh, ended up with a serosanguinous wound discharge. So that's a, a very alarming thing. So what we did was we did a local debridma, closed the wound, the, the, the fascia tightly, and then doing a, a very good uh, skin closure. So the following day, the wound was actually dry. And remember, on the 12th post-op uh, post day, the patient was groggy and all those things. We look at electrolyte imbalance because of the acetazolamide. So the patient ended up with hyponatremia and hypokalemia. So we just corrected that. So, so basically, uh, the patient stayed longer because we, were tried, we tried to be conservative. And the patient actually improved. Uh, and was discharged on the 22nd day. The thing was, you always try to consider myomelingocele, right? And even CSF fistula. So those are the things that we need to, uh, to think about on follow-up. So the patient actually is about almost a year post-op. Uh, he's actually walking normally. And uh, he is due to have a repeat scan. So the lessons is, how do you, how do you try to manage CSF leak? Uh, it's a different story when you recognize it. When it's a prime, it's a, a recognized leak, you need to do a very good closure, right? So, unrecognized uh, durotomy during surgery is somewhere around 6.8%. It happens, actually. So, as I stated earlier, the presence of hematomy formation in the epidural space is actually a good thing for us because in most cases, uh, CSF leak cessation happens in around 80 to 95%. And again, uh, always consider the pressure gradient. So in other words, if you try to manage uh, ACSF leak, always think of trying to reduce the subarachnoid fluid pressure while at the same time increasing the epidural space pressure. So the me methods uh, to try to reduce the subarachnoid fluid pressure includes trying to inhibit the CSF production. And then you usually you may adjust the patient's head position and I haven't tried uh, lumbar puncture, so that's also a consideration. But the thing here is that you don't need to be very aggressive in trying to bring down with a, a subarachnoid pressure because it will end up with uh, intracranial hypotension. And the problem with it is that it will end up with subdural hematoma. So those are the things that you need to actually be conscious of. So acetazolamide is actually a good thing. Some may try to use it in just maybe 48 hours. Some may opt to give it beyond. So Bernoulli's law, this is actually a very important thing for us to understand. As you try to, to, to uh, elevate uh, it in a higher position, the pressure actually comes down. And so it actually is somehow depends on the location of, of the tear. For example, if you have a tear in the cervical spine, most likely you will bring up the head part. 
What, while if you have a tear in the, in the lumbar spine, you may opt to just put them on a, a flat bed or likewise do a Trendelenburg position. So again, it's open for argument. So as you try to, to bring up the head part from a zero position to around 90 degrees, it was found out that the CSF will drop to around 29%. So again, the other is increasing the epidural fluid pressure. So you have a, an epidural CSF pool wrapped with, a, with the muscles around it. Uh, so basically, you have to make sure that you have a very tight closure so as not to create a fistula from the CSF out to the skin. In other words, if you make a very tight fascial closure, you retard the CSF flow. And the other is, again, the hematoma is a friend of ours. So generally, if you end up with some form of uh, a CSF pool in the, in the muscles area, you can consider using a drain to just drain it because as you drain it, the muscles collapses and it actually contributes to the increase in the epidural pressure. So, so basically, these are some of my uh, take home messages. Uh, and uh, if you have some questions, you can throw it to me or Mike can help me with this one. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Tanhente, for a very candid discussion on uh, something that most of us would like to <laughs>
We try to maintain the integrity of the wound by doing daily aspirations, even without the presence of a leak. And then on an outpatient basis, they come back every three to four days, and we do it percutaneously until the wound, the bulge, disappears and dries up. So um, we have not reopened the patient uh, for uh, such a long time, and uh, we, do, um, we do get away with the conservative measures. If there is a leak, we, we suture it with 2O proline, even at the bedside, and just continue our aspirations daily. Um, any comment from our ortho uh, colleagues? Questions? Because it's a beautiful topic. Gilbert, would you like to add, add to that statement? Uh, Kaya nga, show of hands nga, sino ba ang hindi pa nakakita ng durotomy sa inyo? Baka, baka wala pang, baka meron pang hindi nakakita ng durotomy, no? How many gets uh, durotomy every year? Every three months? Hindi, hindi, hindi pa lang. I'm kidding. Uh, so, thank you very much, Dr. Tanhente, for that uh, very good lecture. Uh, uh, this ends our morning session, and we now proceed to the lunch symposium. Don't worry, the food will be brought to your tables, and then we will resume with the next speakers at 1 p.m.